It's my very great pleasure to uh, welcome our participants uh, for this discussion. Economic growth, what governments can, should, and should not do. Uh, on my extreme left, we have Sachin Pilot, uh, who is a former Minister for Corporate Affairs of India and president of the Rajasthan Pradesh Congress Committee. He was, uh, at the age of 26, the youngest member of uh, the England Parliament, the, the Indian Parliament, and before that, he worked for the BBC. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, and uh, as well as General Motors. So it's great to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, uh, next to him is uh, Chan Chun Singh, who is a minister in the Singapore government in the Prime Minister's office. And he's also the Secretary General of the National Trades Union Congress. Uh, after he left the army, he's been a member of various boards and government-owned companies, but he co-chairs a very important committee, the Committee on the Future uh, Economy of Singapore. And then on my immediate left, as we've heard, uh, is Dorothy Leutard, who's Vice President uh, and a Federal Councillor of the Swiss Federation. It's a great honor to have you here. She's one of the <coughs> seven members of the Federal Council, and she's the head of the Federal Department of the Environment, Transport, Energy, and Communications, uh, which, of course, is central to what we've been discussing. I'd like to start, uh, we, uh, I'm delighted in a way to say, we are desperately late and running out of time, <laughs> which gives me great confidence in Switzerland being human. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I'm going to suggest, with the agreement of the uh, organizers of the conference, that we extend this session for 10 minutes, and we extend there for the morning session for 10 minutes. I'd like to ask you really, t we had a fantastic morning uh, with the academic side. Tim gave a great presentation. Uh, then we had that very interesting discussion between uh, employers, federation, and trade unions. Um, then we've had a, a very interesting speech uh, with notes, but no text, uh, which ranged broadly over the whole issue of what we're thinking about this morning. I, I'd like to ask two questions to you. The first is, you're all politicians. Um, I'm a member of a legislative assembly. Could you actually stand up and say, I don't believe in growth? Or do you have to say, I believe in growth and then qualify it? Is it possible to come out and say, representing the people, that I don't believe in growth? That's one the first question. The second question then is, what, can, what do you think your government has been able to do about growth? Because we've heard about austerity. Governments would love to grow, but we're not able to do it. So the question I ask myself is, going back to Adam Smith, what Adam Smith said is, let's deregulate and let's see what happens. We'll have prosperity. But he didn't say you can control growth. Can governments really control growth? So let me start, if I may, with yourself, um, Sachin. Well, I believe uh, sometimes countries, politicians, do obsess about growth. Growth, I think, is important. But what it means for different countries uh, has different takes. I, for one, believe that your question about can a politician get up and say, we don't need growth. Uh, that may not be possible because for most people, growth means prosperity, a better lifestyle, um, better future than what their parents had. Um, at least in developing countries, growth remains really the foundation stone for all political campaigns and for all delivery that governments are aspiring for. Um, but only when you reach a certain quality of standard of living in, let's say, the Western world, can you talk about the philosophy of life beyond growth because you've attained certain, you've ticked off the boxes of what you need for your citizens, and then you can talk about what satisfies you most, what is equitable growth, what is um, nourishing for your soul. But growth remains uh, a concept that is deeply rooted in, in all politics for most countries. But I think there, had, there is life beyond growth as well. 
no one can be like the Bhutanese, right? The Bhutan, Bhutan doesn't believe in GDP. They believe in happiness. Uh, but you can't have happiness if tens and hundreds of millions of your population don't have access to electricity or, or good drinking water, or good education, just basic amenities. If you don't have that, if you can't deliver that, really then talking about life beyond growth is something that is incomprehensible, at least to a large portion of people that I uh, represent uh, in my country. And can I ask the second question? Uh, to what extent do you think the Indian government can really influence growth? Well, I think all governments can. Uh, what the governments should do, really, is to provide re a, a regulatory mechanism, an ecosystem, an environment that, that gives uh, impetus to growth. Growth doesn't happen because the government signs an order. It happens because you facilitate uh, investments, job creations, money coming in, uh, you open up and you reform. And reform, I think, is, is a word that's been overly abused. Uh, not everything that you can categorize as reform is positive. But governments really can create a, a good jurisprudence, a good stable uh, policy regime. All of that work has to be done by the government. Um, but governments also should not overmanage or micromanage. Uh, once government allow things to happen, for example, I was looking after the Ministry of IT uh, in the previous government, and uh, the IT sector in India reached an export earning of $100 billion US. Uh, so we all celebrated. So one of the pioneers of the industry got up and said, well, we've reached $100 billion in export despite the government, uh, not because of the government. So, you know, but, but the fact that the government kept away from the IT sector in India and let it find its own feet and, and be competitive on its own was also a government policy. So over interference, I think, doesn't result in very much. Uh, but growth remains, to my mind, uh, something that we have to do it uh, for, for most portions of our population, but mindful of the fact the impact it will have on the future generations. Uh, the governments really, I think, at least in the uh, Chinese context or the Brazilian or the Indian context, developing countries, governments and the corporate world need to work together to have some semblance of equality. Uh, the, the disparity, the income levels, the lifestyle is so wide uh, that it's, uh, you can't be true to yourself uh, if you say that we don't want growth for everybody in our nations. Thank you very much. Junjun Singh, I wonder if I can turn the two questions to you. Well, I think if you look at it, and we have to ask ourselves, is it growth just the ends or is it the means? And if you look at all societies, we are at different stages or different levels of the Maslow hierarchy. So Pilot is right. For India, growth is about material wealth. For someone in Switzerland, it might be something else. But to me, I think the test of the pudding is this. With growth, does it uplift the human spirit and does it unleash the human potential? And a very simple test beyond GDP is this. All of us grow in different ways. If you ask the leaders of tomorrow, you ask the young people, will they join your country or your geographical entity or your political entity because of the kind of growth that you want? And I think the answer will be very simple. Does it give hope to the next generation? Does this uplift the spirit? Does it unleash their potential? If we can do that, as what Dory was saying just now in the speech, I think we have succeeded. Now then the question is, <clears throat> then what should the government do? What the government needs to do also very much depends on the stage of development of a particular country. I don't think we are dogmatic or we are any philosophical about this. If you look at it, depending on the stage of development of a country, a government can play three roles in varying proportions. One is to lead. To lead because there's market failures, the market is not actually working. The second is that if the market is working and your people have the basic ingredients, then your job is to enable, to enable a partnership to unleash the potential of our people. And then there's a third possible role, which is that in a more fully matured market, you might want to play the role of safeguarding, safeguarding the opportunities for the next generation to continue to unleash their potential. But these trees are not either or. At any stage of development, every government will have to do all these three in varying proportion. Arguably, in a less developed economy, it might have to do more with leading. But in a more mature economy, you might have to do less leading and more enabling. But, you know, if we listen to this morning's debate, I think there was a lot of discussion about what government can do from a policy perspective to try and generate growth. But that is, a, to me, a static concept of trying to generate growth based on the kind of resources that we have. I think what we have missed out or perhaps we need to focus more on is how to create new capacities 
for growth to happen. If workers are displaced from the current job because the economy doesn't need them anymore, it is of no use to spend resources to try and create the old jobs of yesterday to try and give them work. Can it I is just interrupt? Can I ask you, what is Singapore, you make a very good point there, mm. what is Singapore doing? Because, I mean, you have a terrific history of what you've done is over the last 30 years. I think for us, because we are a very small economy, we are price stickers on the world stage. For us, if technology progress and jobs are displaced, we don't have the option to create the old jobs of yesterday for the workers of today. What we need to do is constantly upgrade our workers, invest in their training, invest in their education, health, housing, to provide them the means to create new capacities, to create new jobs for them to go into, which is why uh, at the current moment, we have spent more than a billion dollars to, in what we call the Skills Future Initiative, which is to equip the current generation of workers with the skills of the future. If we can do that, and if we can do that successfully, then we will create the conditions to attract the companies to create the new jobs in Singapore for our workers to earn the salaries of tomorrow. Otherwise, we are stuck in a rut. So I think this is one of the first things that any government will need to do, to unleash the potential of its own people. Now, the second thing is that I'm always wary about government tinkering with macroeconomic policies, be it monetary policy, fiscal policies, exchange rate policies. There's only so much that you can do. But actually, one of the things that I've learned in my stay in a neighbouring country in Southeast Asia is this. The government needs to provide a stable and predictable environment for business. It's not about high or low taxes. Even if taxes are high, businesses know how to adjust and factor it into the cost of doing business. But what businesses do not like is the fact that policies are short-term, unsustainable, and keep changing. It creates unpredictability. If you leave the market to itself, I think they will do wonders. And I've heard a similar story in one of these countries that they say, say, if only the government don't do anything, we will get 6% growth. <laughs> no, so that's the second thing. Do clap. <laughs> but, but that's not for every country. I mean, it's just in that. Then there's two other things I think the government needs to do. And that is, the third thing is that, you know, in an increasingly diverse society, to make good policies, we need to mobilise the public opinion. We need to bring people together. But very often in many political systems today, we lack the political leadership to bring people together, but instead it's the politics of division. And that is why many policies can't work. An average policy well executed is much better than a good policy not well ex executed. But last but not least, if I may come to my last point, is that you talk about politicians. I don't really like the word politicians because it suggests a very short-term perspective of a political survival. I think if we want to do good for our nations, we should see ourselves as stewards, as political leaders that optimise for the long term. That we are here not just for our political career for three, five, six, seven years, but to really do something for the long term as good stewards of the kind of resources that we have been endowed with, to make best use of that. And why is it that most countries can't have this continuity in political leadership? And that goes back to the kind of political systems that we want. Without a stable political system, without a leadership that looks long-term, it is very difficult to have coherent policies for the people. And at the end of the day, if we don't do this well, as stewards of our nation's resources, we do a disservice to our people, and we can never unleash the potential of our people, nor uplift their life and spirit. Thank you. Doris, you've been a federal councillor for 10 years. Mm. Mm. Uh, the highest possible position in Swiss politics. I wonder how you respond to what you feel you can say to your constituents about growth, and then what, as a minister with your department, you can do practically. Well, in Switzerland, I think you won't hear a member of a federal council who says growth is bad. We love growth. 
we, 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 we are happy when our, our economy uh, is doing fine, also to have enough resources for our social system. That's very important uh, again. So I think we should not uh, overestimate the impact of policymakers. I agree on that, but we can do something. Uh, I think uh, India is a perfect example. They, they need a lot of growth. I agree for that. that their priority is uh, still uh, to have a better life for a lot of, for millions of people who still live in poverty. But I think here, policymaker ha has a responsibility. Fiscal policy is something you can you can be attractive or not. I think also um, austerity for me in Switzerland, we have the debt break rule. So we have a certain discipline for the budget and the parliament has to refer on that. They have to, uh, to uh, follow the rules of this debt break. And this was very helpful because it, 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 ha it has some elements of austerity, but it also gives you uh, a, a certain uh, prioritations on spending. So when we think uh, it's very important in the next years to have more resources in R&D, we can do that. So I think this is very important for a government to prioritize where the money goes. And well, what I see in the last years, perhaps sin since the financial crisis, a little bit of backslash that more governments implement also protectionist me measures. India, here, you could improve, I think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think also... How do you define a perfectionist measure? Protectionist measures. Oh, protectionist, protectionist I measures. Thought, I thought this was perfection oh, by, no, no. by a politician. Protection, no. Protectionist yes. measures. Also, well, when I hear by American, that's protectionism, yes. uh, which actually I think it's not healthy for the whole uh, business system. So I think uh, here governments have really to be also disciplined. Here we are closer to Singapore. I think you are also a very open uh, uh, economy. And I think on the long run, it's not, it's not healthy when you uh, protect uh, your sectors. We are in Switzerland also, well, we have one sector, that's agriculture. I think here we are also protectionist. Yeah. That's uh, due to our structures. But here, policymakers can do something. And you, uh, infrastructure, you can see all competitiveness reports. That's one of the main pillars of uh, um, uh, attractiveness of investments. And we know here, I think, India, we know infrastructure for you is a weak point. So here you need investments, but ho how you get the money to invest. And I think uh, uh, energy as well it will be one of the very important parts uh, that we have enough money uh, to have access but also that we have enough supply uh, to offer to our citizens. So there are many elements. The frameworking of policymakers is important. I wonder if I can just ask one question to you, and then I'm going to throw it open to the audience. Um, Christine Lagarde, as uh, the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, has made a lot of the fact that throughout the world we're having economic growth within countries but we're also having increasing inequality and certainly in the country i come from uh, the united kingdom it's a serious problem today uh, you look at youth unemployment in places like italy spain greece it's totally unacceptable uh, you look at america you see great inequality in wealth and income and you can't help but feel that's one of the underlying factors for somebody like Donald Trump's success. He's appealing to people who feel disenfranchised and who for their children see very little beyond maybe they get a second rate job. And I just wonder from three different countries here, very important to the world, uh, how do you see the problem of inequality with growth. Dorothy, can we start? We'll go the yes. other way around this time. Well, I, I think in Switzerland, our Gini uh, indicators Good are efficient. quite quite stable. But uh, you're right, I think uh, uh, first element of our fiscal policy that you pay taxes uh, with your, with your uh, 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 economic uh, uh, possibility. So this has some elements of 
um, equality. And second, I think we have vocational training. So in our system of education, for we have a long tradition that we don't only head for the academic education, but we have for many people, and it's still uh, uh, almost 70% of our youngsters who go first through a vocational training and perhaps afterwards to a bachelor's or master's degree. I think this gives some stability. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of jobs coming from these sectors and it's very helpful for uh, uh, our business area because you find the skilled labor force on every uh, uh, sector and I think this was very helpful for Germany, uh, Austria, Switzerland, Denmark, when you see a, a little bit in these countries we have less uh, uh, youth unemployment than for example in Spain. Yeah. We have a nice project in India to implement also there some kind of vocational training the uh, United States is very interested because I think they realize uh, uh, here in your system of education you have to do something that yeah. people w with other skills uh, have also a perspective. I, I'm afraid I, I have to ask uh, both of you to be relatively brief, if I may. But John Jesus. I think we are all concerned about the issues of uh, inequality. But I would like to push the argument a bit further. This shouldn't be the only thing that we should be concerned about. In Singapore, I think we are even more concerned about the issue of social mobility. If you look at it, inequality is a static current concept. Mm. To solve inequality, you have many ways to do so. You can rob Peter to pay Paul in this generation. You can do transfers. You can try to equalize it. But does that really solve the problem? The more fundamental issue is how do you unleash the human potential of the entire population? That even if I am poor in this generation, I will have the hope that I will transcend my current circumstances and break out of this. And this is the reason why, beyond tackling the inequality at the current moment, the Singapore's government effort is to make sure that every generation, regardless of your start state, you have a fair and equal chance to reach the very top. The measure that we use is not just about the Gini coefficient and so forth. It is that if you are born at the bottom 20% in this generation, what's your chances to reach the top 20% in the next generation? If we can do that, then I think it is a much more uplifting society. If we can't, then you have perpetually the rich and the perpetual poor. And then that will cause social tensions within any society that will threaten to break the fabric of the nation. Thank you. Well, you know, I believe, uh, just a quick point about protectionism, I'll just take 30 seconds. When you talk about farming communities, for example... This is like skiing off-piste. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm coming back to the inequality piece because no, no, two-thirds two -thirds of our, my country lives off the land. That's farmers who till the land and make their livings. Now, when you talk about <coughs> two-thirds of Indians uh, contributing 15% of the GDP, that means that they're working hard enough but not making enough money. Now, to compare a farmer in West Europe to a farmer in India is like comparing chalk and cheese. Now, in Europe, for example, you're fighting to protect the 74 types of cheese you make in Western Europe, but I'm talking about two-thirds of India who are struggling to make two ends meet. Therefore, if it's protectionism, so be it. I'm not even in the government. I'm actually in the opposition. So <laughs> I stand by my government's decision uh, on what they did in WTO. Inequality is something that is going to be very easily tackled in countries like Singapore, for example. But when you make a policy for one-sixth of human race, it's a little bit more difficult to see how you're able to get the, the equality piece fit in. Therefore, the investments that governments do, and here I think she's right, governments have a much larger role to play in countries where their lives get most affected. Frankly, in parts of Europe and the US, governments just exist. They're not the needs of the people. But in most parts of the developing world, the governments have a life contact. So politicians really, I think, are the bridge between what people's demands and expectations are and what the execution bodies and bureaucracies do. So governments really have to intervene and make sure that we are able to divide the growth, as we know it, in a much more equitable and humane fashion than we've done before. Thank you very much. Could we, could we have the lights <coughs> on now, just so that I can see? Thank you very much. Uh, somebody's got their hand up already to ask a question. Uh, I want to turn it over to you. We have 10, 12 minutes or so of questions. Please make a brief question, not a general dissertation uh, <laughs> when you're asking. Uh, one there. 
morning, everybody. I'm if Pranjal. you can just say your name yes, and then uh, briefly I, the question. I'm Pranjal Sharma. I'm an economist uh, and a columnist from India. The definitions of growth are changing all the time. After 50 years of GDP growth in Europe, you say the GDP is not a great idea for the rest of the world to follow. Uh, you want the rest of the world, the emerging markets, to commit to change and sustainability, but the West does not do so. So I think that the whole concept of growth, as you define it, uh, is very different. The moment the rest of the world keeps up to that growth, you change the goalposts. And I think that's very unfair. And the center of gravity, therefore, has shifted to Asia. And whatever worked in the West, I don't think is going to work for the rest of the world. Thank you. Uh, is there, would people like to co comment on that? Anyone with a quick comment on that? We need a completely new concept of GDP because it's become so important globally, we cannot just look back at 50 years of Western development. I, I, I think the chart by Professor Tim says it all. It, says it all depends on which stage of development you are and which level of the Maslow hierarchy you are at. And I think every country has to decide for themselves what is the definition of success. But yes. the rules of engagement can't change every quarter of a century. Yes. Because the World Bank, the IMF, the economists of the world, uh, all the rankings in the world are done on numbers, hard GDP numbers. But so I, if you come to a point where you want to decide to do away with all of that and start a whole new paradigm, uh, I, it's a bit dramatic, I think. Uh, I, I don't it. think we need to start all over again. <laughs> but countries, leadership in the country, respective countries must take ownership as to what you make important. And there's always a saying, you know, sometimes the most important things in life can't be measured, and we make important those things that we can measure. I think that would be set. That would be set. But for every country, be it India, Singapore, or Switzerland, I think we have our respective definition of success, and I think it would be fair that none of us would just use one dimension of, to measure success. Can we have one younger person, one of the uh, younger leaders of tomorrow, not that I'm suggesting the gentleman who just asked the question was an old person like me. <laughs> but gentleman there with his hand up. And maybe a lady, or I should say a woman. Thank you. Hi. Um, could we have your name and then? Yeah, my name is Guillermo. Uh, I've seen a trend that everyone is talking about employment. Um, eventually, some, uh, some jobs are going to be replaced by machines or ro robots. Do you see that as a threat, or how do you um, how do you play with that in in the long term? How do you manage that? How do you how do you design policies for employment in an age of automation? Great question, Dorothy. Dorothy. Yes, uh, I I see the risk uh, that we will have uh, uh, the loss of quite a lot of number of, of jobs. I agree with that, but this was so far a reality by every structural change in the industry. And uh, the, the risk and the fear uh, are always been part of the discussion. And we managed to find other jobs. So there will be changes. That's why the Swiss government presented, uh, I think two, three weeks ago, our digital strategy for the future. And one key element, and this is the duty of governments, I think, now we have to invest in education that we can have new skills uh, for uh, people who perhaps could not adapt as quick enough. So I think it's digitalization as a whole is, f uh, in my uh, assessment for Switzerland, a big chance. And I hope that uh, our economy, our business leaders will uh, profit from this. And we have the, uh, the duty that now we invest uh, in uh, education, that the new skills are really here. And a lot, a lot of people uh, uh, can adapt also in the new requirements of the labor market. Do you have anything new to add what she said? I think the issue of structural unemployment is a serious challenge. I don't think we are not creating new jobs necessarily. The issue is just not the total number of jobs, but the fit. I give you a, a very sim uh, simple example. The retail assistant on the high street shop is probably going to lose his or her job because of e-commerce. But through e-commerce, we will create new jobs data analytics, cybersecurity, and so forth. But the problem is the retail assistant on high street can't in one step 
go to the new job that is about cyber security and e-commerce. In order to fill the one new gap, we need everybody to move along the line. We need everybody to be retrained to the next adjacent job, and then we can get back to full employment again. It's easy to say, but it's not so easy to do because that requires the entire society to come together, to mobilize everyone, to upgrade their own skills, not just for the fellow who have lost the job and not just for the fellow who's trying to fill up the new job, but everyone has to move in step in order to solve this problem. So I think there's tremendous opportunity, but I would say that every government, together with its trade unions, together with the employers, have to play a part in this to resolve this issue of a potential structural unemployment. Sashin. I agree with him. I think 25 years ago in my country, people were saying, if you get a computer in the office, it'll do the job of 50 clerks. That means 50 guys will become unemployed because of one computer. But look at the irony of it today. Two and a half decades later, it is the same technology and the same computers that is giving my country a whole new opportunity of job creation. So societies and demands will find new jobs, but how to scale and upgrade our labor force, that's a challenge not just for governments, but I think for all of us. One final question, and I would like, there's a lady here, at last. <laughs> if you can give us your name and... Good morning, my name is uh, Simona Scarpaleggia. I want to talk about from where? Simona Scarpaleggia from IKEA, Switzerland. Switzerland. Um, gender equality, talking about um, uh, inequalities in the world. Uh, there are studies from International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and even the private sector like McKinsey or Deloitte, that they converge on one conclusion that increasing women employment and empowering economically women is bringing more to the GDP and to the growth and to the welfare than other measurement. So now I have this fantastic chance of having three people representing three important countries. Is there in the plans to do something concrete in order to develop uh, the women employment? Thank you. Well, we must turn to the woman member of the panel. <laughs> to answer that. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't agree more with you. I'm, I'm fully convinced of that. I, in my team, in, well, well, as an employee, I increased the number of women in high positions. And I, I, I've always said, well, we can write a lot of papers and doing studies. You have to do it. You really have to do it. And I think that's uh, uh, what we in Switzerland also have potential to improve. And on the other side, I think for, for a lot of parents still, ch ch child infrastructure must be improved as well. That you have really the choice uh, 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 how much and uh, uh, you, you have the choice if the father or the mother goes to work and follows his career. So here I think uh, uh, we should follow a little bit more the Nordic countries. Well, I think that's a debate that's been going on for a long time, but we've now come to a point that our generation of policymakers are really taking some constructive steps to get that equality. Uh, back in my country, we have government regulations and, and reservations for women. So three and a half million elected representatives in India, right from the village till the parliament, uh, one, more than one third of them are women. And my party is supporting for one third of parliament to become reserved for women. Uh, there's a bit of contention because of that. Um, men feel that they will be eased out of parliament. Uh, but it's not just about government passing orders to make gender equality a reality. It's a societal change. It's a cultural uh, transformation that has to happen. And it will take time. I think I'll be lying to say that you know, next Monday morning, we're all going to be equal. Uh, even in the Western world, people are struggling uh, to get that gender equality. I mean, there are some countries in the Nordic uh, and the US that have much better standards. But we have uh, certainly a large challenge ahead of us uh, on that, in that front. I think it was the Chinese leader, Mao Zedong, who said that the the women hold up half the sky. Well, if we want to unleash the potential of the, the women folks which hold up half the sky, to me, the fundamental is education. If you educate the women, the girls well, it will set them on the trajectory of success. And in Singapore, I think the women folks do even better than the men for various levels of exams. So that is the fundamental. Once we get the fundamentals right, then the question is how do you change the mindset of the people along the way as they enter the job market. But I would just put in a word of caution. And I sometimes I think we do a disservice to the women by trying always to benchmark them against the men. 
I would say that coming from the military background, some things the women do even better than the men. And it would not be right for us to not respect the respective skill sets, qualities of the gender differences, but to try and shoehorn every woman to do the job that the men would otherwise be doing. Recognize that there are strengths in our women's uh, abilities, make full use of them, and then that will be the greatest service that we can do for the women folk. Can I just make one comment uh, to conclude this panel? And that is one thing that's interested me this morning in the whole pan two panels we've had in economic growth, two speeches. Uh, and that is, it was introduced by Tim, uh, the word fun. Uh, we're now talking about women. Uh, we're talking about pollution, degradation of the environment, and so on. And it was Chun Jin Song who mentioned the word flourishing. And it immediately took me back to Aristotle. The whole idea of eudaimonia is human flourishing. And we cannot, and I think this is so important, but we cannot ultimately talk about economic growth simply within an economic perspective, looking at numbers and the material world. There has to be something of the human spirit related to it. I think that has come out this morning to me uh, in a major way, which has practical implications, whether it's the role of women in work or whether it's how you tackle unemployment or uh, with the great Italian trade unionist there, Vicente, uh, of how you deal with public infrastructure investment. It's practical, but it has to be within that greater framework. On that note, I'd like to say a huge thank you on your behalf to the panel and ask you to give them a, a good round of applause. <laughs>